Hello, everybody. All right, we'd like to welcome you to Barnes & Noble at The Grove. We are so grateful to have our guests here today. Um, we'd like to welcome, welcome Matthew Thomas, who is the author of We Are Not Ourselves. This is his debut novel. Um, he is long listed for the Guardian First Book Award and shortlisted as for the Center of Fiction's First Novel Prize. So give him a round of applause for that. This is a novel about World War II and a message of hope and resilience. He has received his Master's of Fine Arts, not too far from here at the University of Irvine, or University of California, Irvine. Um, now in New Jersey, we are grateful to have him here with us in LA. So thank you for that. He is in conversation today with Misha Collins, who most of us know and love as the Angel Castiel from CW's hit show, Supernatural. He is a huge fan of We Are Not Ourselves. He has started an online book club just purely for the book. He got an advanced reader copy, he loved it so much, and said, let's start conversation about this book. Uh, Misha has a very busy life with the CW, so we are very grateful for him spending time with us today and discussing Matthew's book. So we will start our conversation. Hello. Hello. So, um, hi, thank you uh, guys for coming today. Um, you, I understand some of you were lining up pretty early in the morning, is that true? Oh, 4 a.m., that's not so bad. Wow. Big deal. Oh, 12 a.m.? I love that. The one that waited since 12 a.m. got seated at the back. Um, <laughs> that's because you're, you're obviously crazy, so we're going to put you at the back of the room. Um, we're also streaming this on the internet, uh, I think. Is that true, man with camera? Yes, okay, we got a thumbs up, so apparently the technology is cooperating at the moment. Um, and uh, this is very exciting. I'm it is exciting. Thank you for coming to do this. Thank you for doing this with me. It's very exciting. Um, thank you for bringing all these people out here. <laughs> I think there might have been 15 of these people otherwise, so thank you guys. Um, this, I <laughs> no, it's really okay. I, I, mm. um, well, there should be thousands of people at every stop on your tour because this is an extraordinary book that I, um, I just am excited to play any small part in getting more people to read it because I, I found it very profound and moving and lovely in every respect. Um, so I, I, and I honestly feel humbled by the opportunity to just be a part of it in any way. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna cut you off. Um, Matt's like, I'm, Good. Uh, I'm actually just up here to talk the whole time yeah, myself. I, I uh, like that, actually. Um, uh, Matt and I went to college together. We went to the University of Chicago together. We were there at the same time. When, when did you graduate? 97. 97? Same year I graduated. Um, <laughs> and um, we went, Matt sent me a copy of this book, um, and I had not previously, I, I don't think, read mm, anything that you had mm -hmm. written. Mm -mm. Um, and so uh, I at first confronted the text with a bit of trepidation because I thought, oh great, a friend's book. Yeah. And it's not small. I mean, it's an inch and a half thick book. Um, and then I read it, uh, or started reading it, and immediately became engrossed. And by the time I got to the end, I had cried a half dozen times um, and was making everyone I knew read the book. Um, and so, uh, and so I called you, we talked about it, and, uh, and I said I would love to do anything I can to help as many people get exposed to this book as possible. I, I actually was not totally forthright with everyone about the fact that I knew him, because I didn't want people to think I was just touting it because I knew the guy. Because in fact, uh, I would be telling everybody I knew to read this book, whether you had written it or not. And I feel um, exonerated, um, you know, it's not just because I know you that I've been um, talking about this book, because it's now on the New York Times bestseller list. It's been, it's been why, I mean, rave, rave reviews uh, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, E, People Magazine. I didn't even know that people who read People Magazine read books, but apparently they do. Um, it's really, uh, I mean, you, it's been so enormously well received, and, uh, and I think for good reason. 
And so um, without much further ado, we should probably get into it. Um, I, what we could do here, I'm going to be looking at my phone, um, just, you know, whatever, surfing the internet. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to be getting some questions off the internet on my phone, and then we could also have you guys ask some questions of Matt up here. Um, and, and I think we could do a little, little bit of a reading as well. Yeah, and did you want to um, do what we talked about with the participation? Yeah, 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 let's do that. We actually pl we, we planned something. It's going to be crazy, crazy. Um, partial nudity, it's going to be off the hook. <laughs> um, yeah, what did I, 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 wa I wanted to ask you some questions before giving up the microphone, though. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you about the process of writing this book. You, what, what, what was going on in your life at the time that you were writing this book? Um, and how did, you, how did you begin this story? Um, what was the germ for it? Mm -hmm. And when you started, did you have a sense of where it was going? Um, can you talk a little bit about the journey of writing this book, how it came about, and what was actually going on in your life at the time that you were writing it? Because I think that there's probably a lot of writers who are listening to us right now uh, who kind of want to know, how do you do that? Um, or how did you do that? That's a great question. Uh, I started the book at the end of my experience at UC Irvine. I turned in a small section of this as the last thing I submitted to workshop. And then I went off into the world to write it. Uh, and I think I started at the end because it was really easier to be uh, in, in my own space writing it than submitting it to workshop. Uh, I had done a bunch of stories and submitted those. But I wrote this uh, a year after my father died. My father had uh, early onset Alzheimer's and he passed in the first year of my time at workshop. So I got a little distance from that experience and uh, began to write this book really as I was leaving. So I was, a, I was a high school English teacher for most of the time I was writing this. So I would write typically late at night because I had all these papers to grade all the time. Uh, and I would need to get those done to feel like I had mental freedom to work on the book. Uh, I couldn't really write without having the, the other work done. So I would often write late at night, often pretty tired, and I would write a couple hours and go to sleep. Um, that's part of why it took so long, I think. I wrote by hand as well, um, and I would type those handwritten pages in periodically into the computer. Uh, every few months or so, I would just type for a month straight. Uh, and then my wife and I had twins. Uh, a couple years before I finished, uh, we, I took a year away from work to finish the book uh, right when the twins were born. So we had, I was home with the kids and I was also writing all the time. My wife took on a lot of the burden of, uh, of raising those kids for that year and it was a stressful time, but we got through it and the book got done. Um, wow, that's kind of amazing to pull off uh, teaching uh, twins I have, I don't have twins, I have small children who are not twins, and <laughs> imagining multiplying that by two at any point um, sounds uh, not relaxing. It's a zoo. Yeah. 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 Um, what, um, are there, this is kind of an odd question, I don't know if you have an answer for it, but what, was there a particular turn uh, that, uh, in the story that took you by surprise? I mean... We, we talked about this briefly before, but you said that, you know, w the book sort of at, at a certain point took over and you weren't, you were writing and it was evolving, but you weren't guiding it. I don't know if that, I'm, I'm not saying what you said eloquently, so maybe you should say it. <laughs> I think he, uh, Misha's just talking about another feeling that you get, I think, when you're writing sometimes that although you're making a thousand conscious choices, the characters are, are making their own choices and you are working in the interplay between those things and you have to let them guide whatever they want to guide. You can't always try to uh, steer everything in every single direction. Um, you can make choices at the sentence level, at the word level, but sometimes the characters insist on uh, certain trajectories for their, for their story. And uh, I was surprised to find Eileen uh, forming an affectionate relationship with the male caretaker for her husband at one point. I did not expect that relationship to emerge, particularly because it was the last guy in the world that she probably would have wound up uh, feeling close to in any way, I think, but, you know, life is unpredictable, and she, she sees him as a resource, as a valve, as a psychological uh, safety net in some ways, and I was surprised to find that. That's amazing. That's really cool. 
uh, because that felt so authentic. And of course it was happening. When I read it, I was like, yeah, I was starting to feel feelings for the guy too. Um, <laughs> Would anyone in the audience like to ask a question? I think that you probably just have to raise your hand and then we come up to you. Okay, I'll ask you because your pants are the most colorful. Stand up. Let's showcase your pants for these people. Um, snake skin print in rainbow. Okay, wait, do I ask it on here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I haven't finished the book, but in the book it seems like Eileen is very materialistic and um, what are your opinions on that? That is a great question. Uh, she's the daughter of immigrants. She's uh, the, the daughter of a tumultuous home. The, the, the tumult in her home is embedded in her name. Uh, she's seeking psychic comfort in a way that extends beyond, I think, the fixation on a nice house or uh, a comfortable lifestyle. She is in an alcoholic home and I think drives her fears of alcoholism and, and, and chaos underground into a desire for a life that is comfortable, that is settled, and that is predictable. So I think materialism is a way of looking at it, but another way of looking at it is that as the daughter of immigrants, she doesn't have a safety net under her. And it's, I think it's important to understand her, her drive for more as um, a deeply felt psychological imp impulse that isn't necessarily about things as much as it is about settling her spirit down and calming herself down at a very deep level. Um, yeah, so I think that a generous way to read her is to see her as in a state of need, in a state of emotional crisis, even if she's not aware of it consciously. I feel like that aspect of the book really resonated with me at the end because as I was, as I was reading, I was finding myself on the one hand consciously um, disliking a lot of Eileen's uh, values and her choices and, f uh, and judging them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, by the time I reached the end of the book, I realized how much I had I identified with her and how, um, how much I empathized with her. And I think that it's largely because what you're saying, it's sh her, the manifestation of her dissatisfaction in life was you know, grasping for you know, material betterment but we all have that dissatisfaction in our lives. We are all suffering in some way, and we're all looking for a way to am ameliorate that suffering, and that is what makes her so universal and, and, and makes the book resonate with us as the reader so much, I think. And I, I like to think also that she shows her character in her steadfast uh, caretaking of her husband, and uh, when the chips are down, she reveals her, her soul and her character, and. Uh, in the end, I think in, by the end of the book, we see that she is uh, really capable of being very present if she has to be. So yeah, I'm, I, I understand anybody who sees in Eileen, uh, you know, occasional uh, fixation on things that maybe you, you yourself might not be preoccupied with. I'm not preoccupied with those things, but I like to understand the character in the context of her time, first of all, and her, you know, the psychological environment she was raised in and to, to try to take the judgment away, in a sense. Will you maybe f find somebody to ask a question, and then I'll look for a question at the same time? I saw her hand first. Hi. Hi. Um, I've got a question, which is, how close is the character of Eileen to your real mother, and how did your mother feel about the book um, during the writing and now that it's come out? The character is certainly rooted originally in my mother, uh, and in those in the earliest writing, when I was more faithful to the actual facts of my mother's life, for instance, or you know her personality, I just found the writing to be uh, hamstrung by that. Because when you're writing toward a certain person, you tend to take away any of the flaws and uh, quiddities that make somebody interesting. Uh, you try to make a saint out of somebody. And uh, as the character evolved into a character, I was a, uh, and I got distance from her, and she stopped being my mother, uh, she became a much more interesting character to me. I became more interested in her. And uh, I allowed her, because I had distance from her, to, to do things my mother wouldn't have done, to feel certain ways my mother wouldn't have felt. My mother, for instance, is not oriented toward the world the way Eileen is in regards to fear of the other. Um, and we lived in Queens, and we didn't leave because anybody in my family was 
uh, you know, dying to get out of the neighborhood because of how it was changing. It was, it was just uh, a natural movement in our life. But I found that to be an interesting kind of historical figure and character, which is, was very common. Uh, there, was a, there was white flight that happened uh, in the 70s and 80s, in the 60s, 70s and 80s in New York. And I wanted to render some of that in this character because I thought it, it would be able to speak to a larger context, context than just, you know, my family. Um, so I, I, I was able to get distance from her and then able to make a character out of her, ultimately. And when my mother read it, she saw that and she, she said, you know, she didn't say very much because my mother's Irish, so she's not full of praise, but she said, <laughs> good, very good. Uh, and then we moved along, you know, but it was, <laughs> she appreciated the portrait, I think. Uh, and didn't really see herself in it entirely, and I, I think was able to appreciate the, uh, the art that went into the making of the character. Very poignant that she would say good. Yeah. Very good, yeah. which is, uh, if you've read the book. Uh, yeah, that does come an up important, uh, in, an, in yeah. an indirect way in the book, absolutely. Um, here's a question for you, um, oh, which I've now lost. Oh, they, they move so fast. Uh, damn Twitter. <laughs> Twitter, if you're listening, you don't work very well. Um, uh, oh, oh, thank you. Um, oh, shoot. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Patience, everyone, patience. Um, yeah, no, Where's the cat him. in the hat when we need him? I may have. Where is he? Ah, ah, ah. Rachel uh, Elizabeth asks, and I guess, the, okay, so this is on Facebook. Rachel Elizabeth uh, asks, uh, when in the writing process did he, I assume that that means you, uh, write Ed's letter to Connell? Uh, I wrote that near the end. I wrote that as one of the last things I wrote in the book. It, it came relatively in, in a linear fashion at, at that point in the book. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I never got a letter like that from my father, but it, it, it wouldn't have been impossible to imagine that because my father was a tender-hearted man and uh, was the sort of person that could inspire a reflection like that as a writer about what a father might say to a son when he's facing the potential calamitous uh, loss of his intellect and his mind. My father's uh, sweetheartedness uh, I tried to preserve in the book in Ed. Uh, and uh, you know, that letter was an emotionally charged thing for me to write. So uh, I, I kept, I sort of kept it at bay for a long time and then I eventually just gave over to writing it. Um, I want to show you something. By the way, my book is a little ratty. Uh, no, it's not for my tears. <laughs> I don't cry. No, it w I left it in my jean pocket and it went through the laundry. Um, <laughs> actually, I think on this page you can see that there are some, some <laughs> there's a little water damage on, <laughs> on, on this particular page. Um, will you just read like a, a paragraph and a half of this letter? This is a letter that, um, that Ed writes to Connell um, and Connell receives um, after Ed's gone. Yes, he is gone at this point, right? Yes, I've, I've yes, got it in chronological order, right? Um, you know what? Spoiler alert. If you haven't read the book, you shouldn't be here. We're in a book no. club. <laughs> uh, we all read this book in this book club. Sorry. Um, uh, I'll read, read from here. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's like this, this chunk is really lovely. Okay, and and right. imagine re reading this from, from your father. Um, after uh, he's gone. <clears throat> when the hardest times come, I want you to think of this. Picture yourself in one of your cross-country races. It's a hard pace this day. Everyone's out running you. You're tired, you didn't sleep enough, you're hungry, your head is down, you're preparing for defeat. You want much from life, and life will give you much, but there are things it won't give you, and, today, and victory today is one of them. This will be one defeat, more will follow. Victories will follow too. You are not in this life to count up victories and defeats. You are in it to love and to be loved. You are loved with your head down. You will be loved whether you finish or not. But I want to tell you, this is worth summoning some, some courage for. It doesn't matter that you win. It matters that you run with pride, that you finish strong. Years will pass in an instant. I will be gone. Will you remember me on the sidelines, cheering for you? I will not always be here, but I leave you with a piece of my heart. You've had the lion's share as long as you have lived. When I'm gone, I want you to hear my voice in your head. Hear it when you most need to, when you feel most hopeless, when you feel most alone, when life seems too cruel and there seems too little love in it, when you feel you have failed, when you don't know what the point is, when you cannot go on. I want you to draw strength from me then. 
I want you to remember how much I cherished you, how I lived for you. When the world seems full of giants who dwarf you, when it feels like a struggle just to keep your head up, I want you to remember there is more to live for than mere achievement. It is worth something to be a good man. It cannot be worth nothing to do the right thing. Um, lovely. Kind of reminds me of um, Rut, 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 Rutyard Kipling's If. Have you ever read that poem? Great poem. And um, Oh, the Places You'll Go by, by, by Dr. Seuss. Um, <laughs> but for adults and beautiful. Um, Nothing wrong with Dr. Seuss. Um, a genius. We have more questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 um, at Kazoosh uh, asks, I know every writer has his routine before they, what? You're here? They're not even here. We don't discriminate against virtual people. <laughs> Great. I know every writer has his routine before they start to write. What is yours? Oh boy, uh, get the kids Dressed, get them fed, get them out, walk them, uh, break up their fights on the way to school, uh, shake my head when I'm done with that because I'm exhausted and the day hasn't even started, and then go home and start to write. It's, it's not that complicated. Uh, it's not something that it takes a lot of ceremony. Just write as soon as I can, whenever time allows. Just simply get rid of your children. Yeah, exactly, yes, that's right. <laughs> That's a prerequisite. Um, somebody in the back, will you, uh, you, yes, you that went to your toes, ask a question just loudly from there. What was the hardest part of the book to write, and, and what did you cry uh, while writing it? Uh, or are you a real man? She didn't say the last bit, but I mean, <laughs> I think we can infer. Real men cry. Uh, the hardest part for me to write was when Eileen and Sergey say goodbye. I got really attached to that character. Uh, I got attached to him because he provided such a release valve for, for Eileen, and I would have wanted to keep him around, but I knew that it would not be to the book's uh, credit to keep him around because it wouldn't have made sense for any of these characters for that to happen. And I had to say goodbye to him, she had to say goodbye to him, so writing that goodbye, the departure scene, I was, I was feeling a lot of emotion as I was writing it, certainly. Um, and uh, I write by hand, so, uh, you know, I'm just, I was rushing just to kind of get it all out and stay with it. And, and this thing was welling up in my chest as I was writing, and I was, just was, I was just trying to write through it and get to the end of the scene and not forget any of the little moments that were presenting themselves. And, you know, in, when something like that is, is happening, you're, you're just trying to let it come out. You're, you're, you're letting yourself be a conduit for that moment. Uh, you're making choices, but it's, it's a complex interplay where the characters are really telling you what's happening in that scene, and you just have to listen to it and get out of the way as well. Uh, uh, who, who, I'm going to be yeah, her. I'll repeat idea. the question yeah. so that other people can. Who, who was the first character <laughs> that you created in your mind? Uh. Yes, you do sound like that. They, they all kind of emerged out of the ether sort of at the same time because this, this idea of this family, uh, which obviously was rooted in autobiographical material, came into the fore, but I guess an interesting question is which of, like, when did characters start to emerge that I would never have predicted would be in there? Uh, a character that I love, that I feel really connected to is, is Connell's friend, Elbert. Uh, I think of him as uh, Eileen a generation later or two generations later almost. Uh, I think of Elbert as a, as a future CEO, a guy who's gonna rule the world, and he's, uh, He's got a broad vision and perspective. He's being teased. He's being there's a kind of racial component to his ostracism in that in that one scene with them on the phone with him. And he's the son of immigrants, just like she was. So he sees beyond the immediate circumstances of his life, and he's got a plan. I I love that character. I guess that's a that's a roundabout way of answering your question. But these minor characters started to emerge, and that was fun for me to watch them come into being. Yes.
You're, you're so close. You can do it yourself. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, so Eileen's mother was an alcoholic, and I know from experience with my parents, the AA, uh, it was very accurate with the change. And I was wondering, like, uh, how you found that accuracy and, like, how you did your research to make it so, like, well, I guess, again, accurate. It was well, at, at the risk of uh, uh, conforming to a stereotype, uh, part of it wasn't really all that much research that I had to do. I grew up in an Irish Catholic home and, you know, <laughs> not in my immediate family, but there was certainly uh, enough for me to draw on just an ambient noise in the environment of my, of my youth growing up. Neither of my parents was a drinker, but uh, there were certainly plenty of people that I could think about and remember. But I mean, the research I did was more into the psychology of how alcoholism affects people. Uh, you know, I could, I could know about this stuff from personal experience, but I wanted to get it right in terms of what it does to people, how, how it affects their choices, uh, how the adult uh, children of alcoholics behave. Uh, so uh, that stuff is really readily available, unfortunately, because uh, there's enough people out there who are suffering from this illness. I have to borrow your microphone. They took it from me. You, you can't shut me up that easily. <laughs> hi. Hi, guys. Kassan, Catherine. Ah, Emily. Friends. Those are, hi. Hi, Vic. Um, okay, here's a question from Facebook. Uh, this is from Marta Flores. Um, I want to see the live stream, but I'm still learning English. I don't understand much. That is so awesome. Wow. Wow. I don't really know where we go with that, except for I would recommend Pimsleur as a great second language uh, But it will, be in, it will be in Spanish if she's... Oh, it's coming out in yeah, Spanish. It's coming out in Spanish, yeah. What a great opportunity to plug. Yeah. The, uh, how many languages uh, is it getting translated uh, into? 14 as of, as of uh, wow. last notice, yeah. <sighs> yeah. So if you're ever feeling it, bad, you can just be like, you know what? <laughs> Whatever, it's fine. My book's translated in 14 languages. As it's going to be more, probably, yeah. Um, yes, in the back, sir, you. Yeah, you. Oh, what a great question. Are there any characters that you couldn't stand while uh, writing it? Wow, that's a, that's a really great question. There's a, that's a, there's a, <laughs> no, it's a, there's a sophistication in that question, I think. Um, because, uh, well, Kurt Vonnegut once said something to the effect that he tried to love all of his characters. It doesn't mean you have to like them. I mean, love, loving a character and liking that character are not the same thing. Embracing the character's humanity is really important when you're writing any, anybody, even you know, when some, someone who has major flaws uh, and being accurate about getting those flaws on the page is what keeps a book from being sentimental, I think. Uh, there wasn't anybody that I hated. I didn't really like uh, the way the doctor handled Ed. Um, I didn't like uh, the way, the roughness uh, with which the, the medical uh, and insurance establishments uh, dealt with the, the condition of this particular family. Oh, come on, you're taking no responsibility here. You wrote them. I mean, come yeah. on. <laughs> you, I didn't like the way you wrote those people. Yeah, yeah. Jerk. Thank you. That's a compliment, actually. <laughs> um, yes, you. So uh, there's, a, there's a scene wait, in the... Wait, wait, wait. Toward the end, was Connell imagining that he yeah. was losing his memory, or was that really happening? Does that, was that fairly, uh, a fair representation and, of and, your question? And I was going to repeat her question. Oh, too. you were? Yeah, I oh, was. so yeah. I cut you no, off. I was, yeah, thank you. This is getting uh, ugly up here, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, Connell is... So in one of the last scenes in the book, Connell's in before her class. He's, he's come out the other side of all of the tumult and drama in his life and has found himself as a teacher and uh, is very happy and he is teaching in front of his class and has a moment where he's, he's, he doesn't remember what he's teaching. And uh, the question is there about whether or not he's actually experiencing a kind of a, a moment of aphasia, a moment of loss of memory, loss of words. I wanted to make it ambiguous because I don't think it matters if he actually is or not. I think what's important is that he is having a moment where he is inside his father's head for a second. He's projecting himself into that. And there is, and I, I bring up the word empathy in that scene uh, because he's been able to get to empathy after a long journey through a regular adolescence with all the mistakes of adolescence. 
and the selfishness that happens when you are thinking about yourself. Uh, he may or may not be having a moment where he loses uh, his memory. He, he might very well be in the beginnings of early onset Alzheimer's, in, in which case that is, it's taking a very tragic turn. But the important thing in that scene, I think, is that he's, he decides he wants to have a kid regardless. So there's an affirmation of life. Uh, he has been wondering, uh, putting it off. He's been telling his wife he, he didn't want to have a kid because he was afraid of this. And he decides just after that moment happens that, no, I'm going to do this anyway uh, because uh, he's going to embrace life. So it could be one or the other, I think. Um, on Facebook, Emily Wano, I mean, Emily Rose, Wano is uh, the book, <laughs> I think. Um, seems to offer, uh, so We Are Not Ourselves seems to offer a bleak examination of life at times. What would you like your readers to take away from it? Oh, wow. Um, hug each other as much as you can while, you're, while you have a chance. Love each other uh, uh, to the degree that you're able to. Um, ring as much out of life as possible because it's, it's not always uh, going to be there. Um, tell the people you love what you feel about them while you have the opportunity. Uh, don't fixate on uh, successes and achievements because uh, the really important things in life are not measurable that way. Uh, relationships are the most important thing in the world. Uh, it's embedded in my title. We are not ourselves. Part of what I want to say there is that we are not only ourselves, that we need each other to fully be alive. We need relationships to each other to, to feel everything we can on the planet. We are not islands unto ourselves, uh, and, uh, and generally to uh, forgive each other when we, we, when we make mistakes and try to take the long view about people's humanity and try to see people at their best uh, and at their worst, but to see, you know, to see what they're capable of, to, to think the, the best of people if you can. It seems to me that the, that the book is largely exploring sort of the darker side of the human experience. We're, we're in this very dark, unsatisfied, um, protracted period of loss in the book as you're watching uh, Ed deteriorate and you're watching Eileen uh, covet other people's homes and other people's lives and being supremely dissatisfied with where she is at the moment. And yet, at, at the very end, when she is, for all intents and purposes, alone, and we feel somewhat shattered by the experience that she's been through, there's this beautiful scene where she is sitting with the Indian family who now occupies her old home. And for the first time, <laughs> I'm going to tear up. Um, for the first time, she tastes Indian food and experiences um, life to its fullest in this incredibly beautiful, poignant, utterly simple moment. And I think, to me, that, that's what's so lovely about this book, is that it's, ex it, it's, it's a, a phoenix rising. Like, you are finding, by, by, by experiencing, by, by living Eileen's experience as the reader, you're seeing that even in our darkest moments, the most simple grounding in the present moment can be a source of, of uh, infinite joy and life-affirming love. And it is, to me, so utterly uplifting for that reason. Thank you. I'm sorry I made you wait 600 pages to get there. But, <laughs> yeah, because uh, the rest of it was really a drag. <laughs> if, you, if you stay with it, you'll get there, I hope. Um, yeah, she has been stripped of all of her, a lot of her hopes and desires and uh, is left at the end with the moment, the present moment. And maybe for the first time in the book is able to sit still and just be a guest in these people's homes, uh, in, this, in, the, in this family's home, which was her old home and which is so charged for her with so much psychological and emotional uh, weight. And uh, she doesn't expect to connect to them the way she does. I think the gift for her there is the, is the way life hands to you sometimes moments of, of joy uh, that are completely unexpected. She just sits down and, and quiets her mind down and enjoys a meal that she doesn't expect to enjoy because she thinks she hates this food and she thinks she hates it because she has all sorts of fears around change and difference and otherness. 
but she allows herself to be there and she finds, as she bites into it, that she finds it really delicious. Um, so I hope there's a message there of the possibility of uh, surprise in life and, and growth, even at the last minute. It's also a good advertisement for Indian food. <laughs> Well, one thing, one thing I want to say, Connell, one thing I want to establish there is that it's much easier for the character of Connell to eat Indian food. He, in a very, in a blithe way, he's having this very ill-advised conversation with this girl on the plane when he's hitting on this girl on the way home, ostensibly to see his dying father. And, he, you know, he's, he's still in that ad post-adolescent kind of selfish mentality where he doesn't really see what is really in front of him. To him, it's nothing to suggest they go out to eat this Indian food. And I wanted that to stand in for how much harder it is for Eileen to get to that realization. And, and it's when you apply the modes of evaluation of the present to the past and to people from the past, uh, and you expect them to feel the way that we feel, having educated all each other in our kind of generational understanding that we grow together as a people toward ever more sensitivity, if you assume Everybody is at the same point. You can't really see the growth that people uh, make when they, when they make leaps like that. It's much harder for her to eat that meal, but she does it, and I find that to be a triumph for her, and it's one that Connell could never enact because he's already passed that because he has benefited by uh, the enormous sensitivity that everyone around him has inculcated in all of us as we you know, mature as a people and as a civilization. Um, should, we, should we read that passage that we were planning to read? Yes, I would all love right. it, yeah. Um, there, there's a, why don't you introduce the scene? There's a scene where Eileen and Connell go to, uh... Please take out your books and turn to page. <laughs> they, it, we're on page 75. Page 75. Eileen and Connell go to see, uh, the windows on Fifth Avenue. Eileen's mother, uh, when she's, when Eileen is a young kid, Eileen's mother has a, has a very bad, uh, uh, experience with alcoholism, and, and even in the middle of that, she finds the resources to take Eileen on this one time to see the windows on Fifth Avenue. This sticks with Eileen, it becomes very important to her, and she tries to go back as much as she can to reenact this experience. Here's a, a moment where they go together, Ed and Eileen. Should we have um, someone, uh, someone read the role of Eileen? Yes, we should. Okay, who wants to do it? Volunteer from the audience? Somebody, somebody who I haven't talked to already? Okay, um, yes, you who are reaching the highest uh, back there. Yeah, it's you. You're the one with the... Yes, yes, come forward. Yes. No, 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 not you. No, not... Yes, you, 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 you. Point. Yes, you. You, you. Yes, you. You, you know you... With the white shirt on. Is that who you mean? No, I meant the other one. No, Wait. <laughs> you come too. You can both be, yeah, Eileen. Come on you can here. take we'll turns. We'll do it. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's make, make it fair. This is an audition. We'll see which one of you is getting cast in the role of Eileen. Yay. Where can I stand? Um, up here. Okay. I can go back. Hi, nice to Oh, this is going to be very, very dynamic. So I'm going to read the I'm going to read the exposition, everything that's not dialogue, and these guys are going to read the roles of Ed and Eileen. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then you, Misha will obviously you be. You want to be Ed, or do you also want to be Eileen? Ed here. Oh, okay. I just gotta, I, no, I'll be Ed, I'll be Ed too. No, I don't, I wanted to part. Okay. Okay, okay. So we're on 75, I'll begin. You alternate, you start first, you'll see the other one. Okay. Okay. In December of 1970, she headed to the city with Ed to see the window displays on Fifth Avenue. She was excited to see them, despite how corrosively ironic Ed had been about them the year before, when at one point in his Jeremiah, he'd called them altars to consumer excess. She wasn't about to let his grousing spoil her enjoyment of a tradition she'd observed whenever she could since she'd first gone with her mother as an 11-year-old. Ed refused to pay for a parking garage. It took them half an hour to find a spot, and they ended up on 25th and 7th, almost a mile from Lord and Taylor. He refused to let them take a cab, even though she was wearing heels and it was 20 degrees out, with a wind that whipped up the avenue. The sun was setting and store gates were being pulled down as if in protest of the cold. The sidewalks of 7th Avenue were unusually empty. She noticed that most of the cabs that passed were occupied. As they neared the store, the sidewalks grew more crowded, the bells of the Salvation Army collectors jingling in each corner. They saw a pack gathered in front, which quickened her step and made Ed sigh and slow down. She had been delighting in the scene of a golden retriever pulling at the corner of a wrapped gift when Ed, who had been munching his way toward the bottom of a little bag of roasted nuts, broke the spell. These things seem to be here for the purpose of entertainment, he said. But really, they're here to get you to come in and part with your money. 
He spoke in a breezy, careless way that suggested he believed a new understanding had sprung up between them. They're like organisms that have evolved elaborate decorative mechanisms to lure you in. People fall for it. It's fascinating, actually. The bee orchid, for instance, has flowers that look like female wasps. Males try to mate with it, and in the process, they get pollen on their feet, and they spread it around. It's not about the window. It's about pulling you into the store. It's about getting you to leave with something. She was attempting to concentrate on the little animatronic girl whose hand was traveling slowly to cover her mouth, which had fallen open at the sight of Santa Claus's ebony boots disappearing up the chimney. It's a stupefying, hypnotic loop. It puts you in a suggestible state. everything. So do you have to analyze? Wait, you're Eileen though. Oh. <laughs> I like actually, never mind, I like that interpretation of Eileen. Stick with it. Um, do I read what's amazing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So do you have to be so heady? Yeah, that is This is Eileen. great. This is Kay. acting lessons from Misha. <laughs> do you have to be so heady about everything? Do you have to analyze everything to death? I like the other Eileen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's amazing is that they're exactly the same every year. That's an ignorant remark. She spat. They're not all, they're not the same at all. They put a lot of work into these months of planning. She wouldn't have minded his objection so much if he hadn't insisted on drawing her into a dialogue about them. Was it too much to ask to share a moment of joy? She looked around at the other husbands. They didn't look any happier to be there, but they stood back dully, hands folded behind them or scratching their noses. They couldn't have been as cleverly cruel about it as Ed if they'd tried. And the battling of tourists, he said. Every year it gets worse. The jostling, the jockeying for position. They're descending on, on the imperial city for their bread and circuses. I wish we didn't have to do this. She started walking to the train. A couple passing in the other direction gave her curious looks as though they could see the intensity of her disgust in her expression. She found herself unaccountably smiling at one man, giving him a manic sort of grin full of the slightly breathless ecstasy of being unmoored, and he returned it with a delighted blush. By the time she felt a tug on her elbow, she was at the next corner. Don't be hysterical, Ed said. I was just making a few observations. The world isn't a lab. <laughs> Come on, he said. Let's go back and look. In his worn jacket with the frayed sleeve ends, he looked like a war veteran about to ask for change for the subway. You ruined it. Don't say that. Listen, I can't help myself sometimes. I don't know what's wrong with me. I do, she said. You didn't have enough fun as a kid. He pulled her arm, but she wouldn't budge. She watched steam rise from a manhole cover and felt in her chest the rumbling of a passing bus. She was keenly aware of the limits of the physical world. She wanted to be in one of those scenes in the windows, frozen in time, in the faultless harmony of parts working in concert, fulfilling the plan of a guiding, designing hand. It would be lovely not to have to make every decision in life, to be part of a spectacle brought out once a year for the safest of seasons and put to work amusing people who stared back in mute appreciation. The real world was so messy, the light imperfect, the paint chipped, the happiness only partial. One of these years, we will come here and you will enjoy it and not make me feel miserable about it. I dream of that. Let's let that be this year. Let's go back and look at those windows. Please, honey, let me make it up to you. It's too late. She it's said. never too late. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> she hadn't been looking at him. Now she stopped to. Streams of people flowed past in either direction, rushing toward obscure destinations. This was her life right here, petty as it seemed at the moment, and this was the man she'd chosen to spend it with. He was holding his hat in his hand as if he'd taken it off for the purpose of beseeching her, and she saw that he would always have flaws, that he would always be a little too intense in his objections, a little too unbending when it came to the decadence of the world. She thought, we can't all wear a hair shirt all the time. But there he was, trying to pull her back to the scene he despised, and she saw that he couldn't live in a way other than the one he thought was right, and when he saw what the right thing was like now, he cared about it as if it were the only thing that mattered. Everyone else around seemed as insubstantial as the air they moved through, the shopping bags they carried, the only things anchoring them to the ground. Did I tell you I love what you did with your hair? Why don't you read the, the last thing? <laughs> read the rest. He said, and she let herself be mollified because she thought he hadn't noticed. She took his hand. Take his hand. They retraced their steps, the street around them thrumming with life. 
She saw that there was something perfect about the imperfection of her husband, her mortal, living husband with his excessive vigilant about the effects of capitalism and his unmistakable pair of bow-legged <laughs> that she watched carry him forward. She kept her eyes on his shoes, hitting the pavement and letting him guide her wherever he was going. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. You guys. Thank you. Yes. Um, excellent, excellent Eileening. Um, she wants to ask a question. Oh, um, yes. What advice do you have for aspiring writers? Keep oh. going. Don't stop. Don't let the world stop you. That's it. That's the only thing you need to do. Just work whenever you can. Okay. So I think that that pretty much brings us to conclusion here. Um, there's, wait, do a picture with those guys? Is that what you said? Okay, where does, okay. We're doing some logistics here. Let's, let's bring this to a more, let, let's uh, we'll, uh, deal with this in one second. Thank you all for coming out. It was such a pleasure and an honor to me that you showed up. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing this lovely work of art into existence. We are grateful. And, um, and thank you, Misha, very much for your support. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you're welcome. This has been so pleasant. Yes, after that fight that we had midway through, it's nice that we've <laughs> resolved things. Um, we're going to do some book signings. I think that that's going to happen here. And to, I'm not going to sign the book because technically I didn't write it. Um, but if you want to take pictures, I will take some pictures over here. Um, do we have a photographer for that? I have, and when, when I say over here, I mean over there. Um, and thank you, uh, everyone who tuned in on the internet. Thank you. You are not you lesser people for not being here in person, <laughs> in spite of what some of our audience might think. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks yeah. again.